This is a production of Cornell University. I'm introducing it, so uh, I don't have anything prepared, and I haven't memorized the very, very long list of all of uh, Professor Schwartz's books and all of his uh, prizes and teaching awards. Um, I will simply say that uh, Dan Schwartz is the uh, Frederick Whiten Professor of English and a Stephen H. Weiss Presidential Fellow, and he's going to be talking about his new book, In Defense of Reading. So welcome, Dan Schwartz. Thank you, Roger. And, uh, thank, 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 thank you all for coming. It's very, I'm kind of touched by this audience. Um, what I'm going to do today is talk for a half an hour, maybe 35 minutes, no longer, uh, about the book, and uh, then I'll take some questions. This book is part of a series uh, called the Blackwell Manifesto series. And uh, the idea is to ask people who have written a good deal uh, to really do exactly what they want to do. That is, it's kind of, I, it, this sounds like a boastogram, but they say ask major critics to make timely interventions. And uh, then, and the idea is to write a book really for, not, for undergraduates to postgraduates, but also suppose, hopefully to have some uh, uh, appeal to a general audience. So uh, that's what I, I, I tried to do. And the book uh, really has, it has six chapters. And the first, uh, there's a preface talking about my ideology of reading and how I teach a little bit. And then there's six chapters. The first is uh, Entire, it's called The Odyssey of Reading, and this is a chapter which talks about how I think about why we read and how we read. And, uh, and, then, the, uh, then, there's a th and then there's a second chapter, which again, which talks about reading and uh, what we learn from our reading. And that chapter, uh, and the, the first chapter too, has a fair amount of close readings and analysis of texts but in a way that I hope avoids the academic jargon. And these are texts that are well, pretty well read. And then I talk a little bit about uh, my own career in a chapter called Eating Kosher Ivy and what it was like to be a Jewish professor in an Ivy League school when there weren't too many, and particularly too many who had a New York accent. And uh, so I talk, and then uh, there's also a, then there's a chapter about how I integrate teaching and reading, and some of my students would recognize my voice in that, and how I teach at various levels. And then the last two chapters are sort of talk about what I call the poetry of the university, uh, and I talk about some of the ideals of, an America, of a university. And then in that chapter, I also talk about what I call the prose of the of a university or the economics of a university. Uh, I guess. Uh, it was somewhat prophetic because I didn't know we would have an economic crash, but I was talking about how uh, humanists function in the, uh, acad in the academic world. And there's a fair amount in that chapter of things about the uh, financial underpinnings of the modern university. And uh, I did some work in that area, uh, somewhat helped by Ronnie Ehrenberg, whom I thank, and who knows a great deal about the economics of the university. And then finally, the, chap the last chapter is really uh, addressed to people in the profession, and I consider the profession and how it's going to evolve in the 21st century uh, and what, uh, how uh, the humanities will probably be taught. But I also talk about how one makes an academic career in a, in a stringent environment and uh, talk about some of the issues uh, within literature departments as opposed to uh, general university. So those, and, I, and it should be said, particularly to this audience, that most of this book, or much of it, is inflected and, and defined by 41 years of teaching here, minus some sabbatics and times when I was a guest scholar somewhere else. But this is really a book with a very strong Cornell inflection. So that sort of lays out what I was, what I was doing. And let me talk now a little bit about my credo as a critic and as a teacher. Uh, some of, me, some of my, my colleagues will, of course, recognize this, and so will um, my students. And incidentally, thank you all for coming. Uh, if the students want to sit up front on the floor, that's, that you could if you wanted to. Is that all right? 
Then, okay. All right, Aaron. All right. So let me state my own credo. And some of this may sound slightly simplistic, but it speaks to really some of the issues that are at play in the humanities. Literature is by humans, for humans, and about humans. The humanistic critic understands artist lives in, hum in human terms rather than as superhumans as a di or of a different species and realizes that there's a place for both biography and history and understanding literature. I, usually, I, I teach really with a certain number of principles in mind, one of which is uh, I say to my students and my, uh, always the text and always historicize. And I guess I've been saying that for a long time. What that means is that we have a healthy respect for the words on the page, the text, the isness of the text. And we also, and we, we appreciate the aesthetic, we appreciate the beautiful, and uh, we look and so we try to look within the imagined ontology or the imagined world of a work, and we ask who's speaking to whom and what happens here. And that first part of my mantra, always the texts, leaves room for, for appreciating the felicities of language that render the particular, and also leaves room for responding to uh, human motions dramatized within the text, as well as to the felicities of language, the beauty of significant form. Uh, when we talk of the meaning of significant form, we are really also talking about the significance of meaning. And one of the things that I was taught as really the only way when I was younger uh, to understand literature was to think about the inextricable relationship between form and content. I grew up in an age where historicism was somewhat uh, put on the back burner. But gradually I understood as I started to teach and write that one has to know a good deal about the histor history. And what always historicize means is that it gives us space for understanding an artist within his historical and cultural context. And, the, and we understand that writers respond to uh, historical moments. That we can't, we don't really, there's no such thing really as the historical fallacy or the biographical fallacy. And in fact, I consider myself a pluralist who tries to bring to bear really every kind of critical approach. One of my other ideas about reading is the text teaches, uh, teaches us how to read them. So in fact, we read texts differently. For example, when we read a text like James Joyce's say, we, we want to know more about biography than perhaps we need to know about a different kind of writer like Wallace Stevens. So writer books, in fact, often teach us how to read them. And in a book, for example, which this sounds like a complicated example, but in a book like Joyce's Ulysses, where uh, in, in, in a chapter in the book, in a middle chapter, he explains uh, how he reads Shakespeare, the character does, and he tells us that reading in terms of a character's life is something that we need to take very seriously does this not without some irony, but still you are sort of, the book is telling you to look for what might be called an expressionistic aesthetic. An expressionistic for the non-academics here means a writer uh, reveals and writes about his own psyche and his own values. So one time, so historicize includes understanding an artist within his historical and cultural context. It also, uh, historicism can mean also understanding things that are not fully expressed. That is a, a kind of, we sometimes bring from our distance at a later time things to a text that the writer may not, for one reason or another, have made uh, particularly clear. So there's kind of an historicism of trying to develop, to recreate the milieu in which a writer wrote and there's also a second historicism to think about what are the social and political factors which make characters who they are, say, uh, take for example Balzac's Pergorio. And then finally, there's a historicism which actually s places the reader in a, in, a, in a position in relationship to the text. And that third kind of historicism we sometimes call 
uh, resistant reading because we sometimes notice things that the original, uh, that the text, maybe even the author, didn't quite bring to the foreground. Now, what is an example of that, Schwartz? Okay, here is an example. Uh, an example would be something like The Secret Sharer. When uh, Conrad wrote The Secret Sharer, it is not absolutely clear how much he had uh, homosexuality in mind as a theme. And certainly the first and second generations of people writing about Conrad did not uh, even mention homosexuality. And yet later on, critics uh, became aware, that is, uh, of the fact that these two guys are sleeping in the same bed, which is approximate, in a, it's a bunk bed in an English ship with the approximate width of this table. And clearly something is happening when two men at the se are sleeping in the same bed. Whether they have full sexual relationships or are a strong homosocial so bond is somewhat questionable. But they look and admire each other naked. So this is an example of our, the reader, in, uh, historicizing here is an, it, it means seeing what the, where the reader is uh, in relationship to what's being dramatized, whether, whether the, the uh, author is aware of that or not. And, uh, that's a, a kind of historicism. So historicism simply means, not so simply, means being aware of social and economic and historical factors that, uh, that affect a texts. Uh, and sometimes uh, I'm asked, what, what, uh, what, what, is there a truth criteria for, for, lit for literary criticism or for reading? Uh, can you actually, is it all up for grabs or are there better and worse uh, ways of, of seeing if you uh, understand, say, either the aesthetics or the historical context of a text? And the answer is, I think, a kind of tentative yes. I think we all read differently. One of the things that I was taught is that there was an absolute reading, that if we all studied the text long enough, and thought about it hard enough, we would come to the same interpretation. That's probably not true. That is, we all bring something different to a text. There has been some writing in, the, in recent decades about interpretive communities. That is, if you have a group of people with the same training uh, or, and the same experience with the text, would they come to approximately uh, the same reading of a text? And the answer is probably not. Probably the largest interpretive community is one, because we each bring something different to text. And I think when we teach in, a, in when, when, when we're in a classroom situation, we need to acknowledge that, and we need to listen to our students. I mean, with, and, and 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 to appreciate that there are multiple ways of seeing. Is there a truth criterion for reading? Well, that's also hard. I sometimes have difficulty with people who theorize about post-colonialism and who have never been to Africa or to third world countries. It's all very well to talk about uh, Africa, but when you go there, you realize that there are great ambiguities, for example, and that while, as an as intellectual said to me uh, in Zimbabwe, um, colonialism is, was bad, this is worse. And so you need to, we need to sort of not, uh, we need to be aware actually, I think of some uh, of the underpinnings of, of, of books. And I think the more you know, I mean, this is something I think that's very important. The more you know about context, whether it's political, the better readers you are. And so I think at least that the fact that, that, that I've traveled helps me understand, but that doesn't give me, you know, the, the ticket to perfect understanding. But I think that it does, it does help. I mean, so I guess I want to say before closing the comment uh, right now on historicism, that one meaning of historicism, not the only one, remember, but one meaning is to keep one eye, one's eye on what Robert Frost called, I like this quote, the larger excruciations by which he meant, I think, hunger and poverty and war and tsunamis, and not to think that literary texts 
e e exist in a vacuum. In other words, I actually think one understands, uh, for example, uh, a, ta a text by knowing something about history and contemporary texts, and I, uh, by 20th century texts, texts by Gautam or Achebe, people like that, by knowing more about what happened uh, in, in Africa and what is happening. And, I, and if this, this, I do talk a little bit about my, one of my other fields, Holocaust studies, in uh, my book. And again, I think I try to show, I show that historicism is extremely important and maybe even more important in that field than some others. But I don't think the balance between the text or always the text and always historicized is, is the same in every text or every problem. Nor do I think there's one way to teach a course. Uh, I guess in my own teaching, I tend to still be a formalist. I'm very interested in beginnings and endings and about the imagined world of the text. And, uh, and, I'm, uh, and I'm interested uh, in how texts uh, signify. And I guess I'm still interested in formal issues. And I use them in my classes, as my students, many of whom are here, some of whom are here, uh, know. Uh, but I, but I, I, and I, and I think, I still think asking questions about ascetic issues, who's speaking to whom, who's narrating, uh, you, and one can do that, you know, you can do that at a very uh, sophisticated level or a, with, with a very elaborate vocabulary, but you can also ask these same questions almost without getting into words like extra diegetic and things like that. So you, you need to, I think that, I, and I think part of what I'm talking about in this book is this relationship between uh, teaching and writing. Now, what I try to do uh, is, is in my classes and in this book is show how different kinds of questions uh, are appropriate for different kinds of texts. And I, rather than write 30-page uh, chapters, which I've done on lots of these books and other venues, I just write, I write a handful of, I write maybe 10 or 12 pages on quite a number of texts, sometimes talking about how books begin, how books end, how books move, talking sometimes about poems. I've talked about Holocaust texts. So this, I try to Te you test some of my ideas in very different kinds of, uh, of uh, situations. And uh, usually starting out, as I do as a teacher, with very basic questions rather than very, I think I th ask questions, as I said, like who is speaking to whom and why, what is happening to the people within the imagined world of a text, always remembering that these are not real people, but that they're metaphors or figures for people what is their role in the narrated events and how do they resist, affect, or change the events? Uh, what is the historical context and what is the social economic cause and effect within the imagined world? In fact, there are some, in general, you have much more of a political and social and economic cause and effect in European novels than you do in the English novel of manners. That's just in general. You see much more of that at work in Stendhal or, or Balzac uh, than you might, or, or certainly Tolstoy than you might see uh, in the novels of Jane Austen. But that is not to say that there's not a strong historical perspective there. So these are some of the things I talk about. Um, I, worry, I used the word uh, pluralism in, uh, before. And what do I mean by pluralism? This is a term that's fairly uh, important to my aesthetics. A pluralistic approach allows for sort of multiple perspectives when talking about a text. And we already talked about some of them. That is, we talked about the aesthetics. We talked about historicism. We talked about the kind of subdivision of historicism, which is sort of resistant reading or new historicism. But and some pe what I think is, is that pluralism is a way of having a dialogue uh, among different approaches. Uh, and I think that is important. I think it's, I think it's, in my teaching, I don't like to impose one way of looking at things upon a text. And I like to uh, talk about how different approaches work on a text. This is something that's actually been argued about in 
by a, a, a leading critic named Gerald Graff. He calls it teaching the controversies. And I don't quite do that. In other words, I, because I try in my teaching to keep my eye on the primary text. In other words, I try to bring in multiple points of view, but I don't necessarily in undergraduate classes spend a great deal of time reading secondary material that would represent every sort of approach. Or, but I might bring it in and kind of what might mediate it as opposed to have the students. I know there are classes, and I've actually talked to Graf about this, and that they read a lot of secondary material. It's good to read secondary material, but you don't want it to replace the primary material. Now, let's talk about what we do as humanists. I gave, talked about my ideology of reading and a little bit about my teaching. And I guess when I think about it, I probably should say one more thing at this point. Um, as you can see, I don't really want to read a text uh, about what I, my, my idea of teaching is to build what I call a community of inquiry. That is, I want to draw upon the interest of the students even while contributing to their growth. So in a class, for example, this, uh, the Holocaust class, which had its last meaning today, one of the things we try to do is to, is some of the students come from backgrounds where they have, they're the children of survivors. Others of them are, take the course because they're interested in German studies. Others of them take the course because they're English majors looking for another course. And some of, the, and, and some of them are history majors. But the idea is to try to, to build what I call a community of inquiry by tapping the various interests and strengths of the students so that can we have that kind of colloquy. And I think that there's obviously the material is foregrounded, but one of the things I try to do is, you know, is, is think about a class is by humans, for humans, about humans. In other words, I try to remember that we're not just talking into free space. Some very many, many years ago, uh, uh, a high school teacher that I very much admired claimed that uh, high school teachers teach the subject to people and college teachers teach the subject. And certainly I've seen that in universities, but we try to, but I try to eschew that particular mode of operation. Now, what is our role of you as humanists? There's a transition now. Our role as humanists is to focus attention as what, on what is special and distinct in the human enterprise. In my case, that has ranged from studying and teaching the magnificent experimental novels of Joyce, Conrad, and other modernists. For those of you who are not academics, we think of modernism. Modernism, when I went into it, was uh, the period from about 1890 to 1950. Uh, now literary modernism has become the period from 1500 to, uh, to 1950. But so now my period, which was called modernism, is now called high modernism. That's just, these things change, right? And uh, so what I teach what's called modernist. And what I try to do in my classes uh, is talk about modernism in its cultural milieu. I do quite a bit with the relationship between art and literature. And that's been kind of one of the areas, I suppose, which um, I'm known for. And I talk a bit about that in this book, but not as much as I'm not trying to sell another book. I, but another, as I did in the book that was sort of the the opening in that, into that area for me. And, uh, now, what, and, and of course I now also teach about the literary, uh, the, the literary depictions of the horrors of the Holocaust. We need to remember that art, art, and of course I'm teaching a subdivision of art, literature, and sometimes art, painting, is how we make sense of the world. Literature is about how we transform world into words and words into world, right? Some of you Joycians know that. Uh, literature and the other arts are a window onto who we were and who we are. And when I teach and when we read, I think we need to strike a balance between addressing ethical and political issues raised by artistic, artistic works as well as the forms. I think literature professors also need to focus on the creative act. We need to understand how imagination transmutes a kind of a vision of the world into something that is an imagined world. And I think that's part of what we do. 
And we've talked a little bit already about what else we do as, culture, as a cultural historian, we focus on historical and social contexts. Now, let me talk a little bit about this profession, which I've so proudly been part of and have enjoyed so very much. I began teaching at a time when many literature students and professors had an idealistic sense of mission and believed that reading canonical texts carefully was a mean to heighten students' awareness of the world around them, increase their ability to make moral discriminations, see themselves more clearly, and understand the behavior of others. That is often thought now to be an obsolete way of looking at literature. And yet I still believe it. I still believe it's not the only way, it's not the right way, but it is a way. I still think that reading texts, notice I left out canonical texts, we read different, we've expanded our interests to include other art forms, even literature, uh, literary pr uh, professors have. And we understand that there may be canonical texts are not the only kind of text. We understand that we can learn both from high culture and middle culture and low culture. And that we don't, that, that, that there's not, uh, that the, different, the differentiation between high culture and what we might call popular culture is not so, quite so arbitrary. And in fact, recently I wrote a book about popular culture, uh, which probably somewhere somebody said, what is he doing? Nobody, and it's a book about Damon Runyon. It was called uh, Broadway Boogie Woogie Damon Runyon in the Making of New York City Culture. And I use that example not to send a boastogram, but to just explain that this was, a, I'm doing work now that an English professor didn't do. Remember, part of my title was Teaching Literature in the 21st Century. If I had written my book on the Holocaust as my book coming up for tenure in 1973, it would have been a passport to obscurity. You couldn't do that. If I had written my Runyon book, same thing. Right now I'm working on a book on the New York Times. That is, the, we've expanded what English professors can do in a very healthy way. So when I said that I still believe that reading text carefully is a means to heighten students' awareness of the world around them, and I would add to students all adults, all of us, and I still believe reading increases our ability to make moral discriminations, to see ourselves more clearly and understand the behavior of others. So in that way, but what I think is a very positive, optimistic way, I am sort of an antediluvian in some circles. Uh, but we believed we had a sense of mission. We thought our work was important and not simply part of making a career or getting a professorship. And, as I, and I write in the book about some of the changes in the profession, and I also write about some of the, futures, the future of the profession. But I guess I want to just say now, as I move on to, to the, my next topic, and I'm only going to talk for another five or ten minutes, my belief that great texts have gravitas and that by understanding their precision and, and, and their subtleties and intricacies we learn from them is still an important part of my passion for teaching. Okay? So, um, obviously reading has changed and we need, and the things, some things have changed very much for the better. We have a diverse faculty. We have a diverse sense student body. This is wonderful. Uh, the canon is undergoing to change. There were people, there were writers that were valued when I was in graduate school and a few of others who have been kind of, have become kind of remote parentheses. And then there are other writers who have become foregrounded. And all of this is good. Uh, talking about literature and music in the 20th century is wonderful. I don't do it very well, but I enjoy hearing the people who do it very well. Do it, do it. Uh, we, so I think we also need, uh, at some point, and I talk about this in my book, to talk, take pleasure in the joy of teaching 
and appreciate what we as teachers do. And when I think about teaching, I think about, we all, I think, I think a literature teacher really has uh, four missions. One is to teach students how to read with sensitivity and perspicacity. Uh, a second, a second is to think them to think, to think critically, by which I do not mean thinking in terms of literary jargon, but to analyze, to not trust everything the professor says, to think for themselves, to respect, not to just tell them, but to ask them. Uh, I've always, I, I remember reading a long time ago, I think Jacques Barzan had said that an impressive professor was an oppressive professor. We want to listen to our students. The third thing we need to do is teach them to write. And when I say third, I'm not, I should, these are fourth of equal value here. Writing is a, teaching writing, and teaching writing in a way that's teaching clear and lucid writing, not just academic ease. And, uh, and the fourth thing that we, we should stress more than I sometimes think we do right now is to teach people to talk, to give a talk. So many times when I go to conferences, people just read papers. Nobody, you know, if I were reading this talk, several of you would have gone to sleep already. And uh, possibly I would have too, because I wouldn't have to think of what I'm thinking next. So I think that those are our sort of missions as uh, teachers. I use, uh, in my first chapter, I talk, I talk about something called the odyssey of reading. And this is a metaphor that I use as a way of talking about what happens when we read. And I do so in terms uh, that tries to show us how it, we move from beginning to ending. Uh, but I also think about reading as a journey of the mind to understand the world beyond itself. And I talk a good deal about what happens when we read and, or go, and in fact go to a film or a concert. But mostly my, my concern is with imaginative literature. Complex texts that present difficulties and frustrations, texts such as Moby Dick or Ulysses, which some of my students in my Ulysses class are here, tend to make reading a journey with setbacks and challenge. Like the protagonist undergoing a quest, we are often buffeted about and need to stop frequently, particularly when these texts are long. But when we pick up the text, we resume our journey. The destination of our odyssey of reading is the moment when we close the text after our last word. But that's, of course, the beginning of another odyssey, the odyssey of reflection. And I sort of press this metaphor, at least for a while in the first chapter. I think of reading as a kind of travel, an imaginative voyage undertaken while sitting still. And I talk about what happens when we read. Some of this I talk about in, in some depth and talk about stages of reading. And I'm not going to talk about that today. It's a little, but reading is immersion. Reading is reflection. Reading takes us elsewhere, away from where we live to other places. We read to satisfy our curiosity about other times and other places, to garner information about what is happening in the world beyond our lives, and maybe even to gather our courage to try new things. Even maybe we find in reading sometimes admonitions not to try certain things. So we, we, we read to learn about experience. And it may even be about experiences we haven't tried. Our readings help us formulate narratives. What does that mean? It means our readings help us formulate narratives in the terms of our hopes, our plans, our putative triumphs, our imagined future. And that, too, that reading also helps us understand our past. Words enable us to discover, and I use this in the subtitle of the Odyssey of Reading, enables us to, of our, it tells us about ourselves and our origins. Words I've stolen from Wallace Stevens, uh, who was a, one of my favorite poets. I think uh, I want to talk, I guess, before I quit, a little bit about uh, 
the future of literary studies. And then I'm going to stop and, and, and take some questions since I've talked a lot, maybe 35 uh, minutes or so. And this is something uh, I think some of you may want to, if we have the discussion, a little uh, chime in with some other ideas. What, what kind of profession, I ask myself, will, uh, will succeeding generations find? And this is obvious, you know, I've been asked this question often, and so I decided to think about it knowing that I'd probably be wrong on a lot of my guesses. I think the future of English literary studies will be literary studies in English. That is, there'll be more reading of, trans, of, of translated texts. There's going to be more, there's going to be, I think, more emphasis on globalization and non-Western literature. Uh, and I think there's going to be more courses that are not just in, in uh, national literature, uh, but in, uh, there'll be co more courses. What we now call comp lit uh, is, a co is, a, is uh, courses in other than English literature and sometimes English literature thrown in. I think there'll be almost a, a somewhat of a merging of the fields of English literature and comp lit. Uh, I think also we're going to be more aware about how East and West have shaped cultures in both areas. I think we're going to understand that the division between East and West that many of us were educated in is extremely arbitrary. There was in a recent exhibit which I saw at the Metropolitan Museum, Venus, Venice, Venus, Venice in the Islamic world. Uh, and which examined the relationship between Venice and Islamic culture over a thousand year period. And I think we're going to see more of that. We're going to be uh, aware, more aware of how art in different cultures has different purposes. We uh, are beginning to understand uh, that the decorative and aesthetic function of Western art is not carried over into African art. That African art makes masks, African art, for example, have pra has practical uses, such as the masks in tribal rituals. Carved pillows and walking sticks are art. And we're going to understand then also that some of the literature that comes out of, of uh, African Africa, such as Achebe, is going to have, have different uh, purposes. Uh, and, and I think we're going to come to appreciate in the future more different kinds of popular culture. The artistry of furniture and automobile design, for example, has been foregrounded at the Guggenheim. And if you'll notice when you go to museums, tapestries are now used to, uh, are, are much more uh, likely to be uh, uh, involved in the main museum. You know, the, a lot of the, for example, if you wanted to see tapestries, you used to have to go to the cloisters up there. Now a lot of that stuff is actually being brought back to the main museum. The point is, is our understanding of art has changed. And now you're thinking, yes, but what, what is he going to say about the internet? That's the very next point. Uh, <laughs> digital and video art forms, YouTube, things that I barely understand. I mean, Marsha and I will get, be having brick, breakfast and she'll ask me what Twitter is. And uh, so, but I mean that is, there's going to be the aesthetics of email. There's going to be the historicism of email. Things that we don't even, there'll be younger scholars will work on projects that I can barely imagine. More courses will be offered in literature and translation. And translations will include languages that we, know, we haven't imagined, really. I mean, we, there, there'll be more translations of Hindi and Urdu and African languages that we barely understand. Uh, and of course, this creates a different problem because it's very hard to do formal analyses of translations. And so this, will, this may, in fact, nudge us further away from sort of aesthetics and more towards uh, talking about uh, content because we are, most of us at least my generation are trained to worry about the aesthetics of translation. Why? Because you're not looking at the original words, you're looking at somebody else's words. Uh, probably shaped by the internet our criticism and scholarship will be more collaborative even though each of us may be working alone on our computer, sort of along the lines 
of Wikipedia. Uh, let me, I want to close by talk, making one or two, one other suggestions uh, about the future of literary studies. I expect in the fund, in, that, that fundamental anthropological and even neurological questions will be asked within the field of literary studies about how memory and imagination works. I noticed the New York Review had an article about memory, a book by Susan Kaplan, and I have to admit I didn't understand everything that was being written. But we're going to be, I think we're going to ask within the field of literary studies about why humans have the capability and the desire to deal with fictional worlds. Why we, uh, why we often do so. Deal with our, do, deal with fictional worlds and why we often deal with our own reality in story form. What is the, the we, what not only is, we, we've asked what the nature of narrative is, we're going to ask, I think, what the human need of narrative is. And it may be a human need that has issues of DNA and its neur neurology that we don't even begin to understand. I think we're going to draw upon work now being done in cognitive studies and perhaps discover enhanced ways of reading. Our discussion of narrative will be more informed by the discoveries of science. We will, think, we will be thinking more precisely about how memory and imagination works and how we talk and things like that. And more deftly, we'll be able to understand how we transmute memory into narrative. We may learn, perhaps, from the next generation of graduate students, or the next, far more than we know about which of our human needs are fulfilled by reading in silence. Think about reading in silence. We didn't talk about that in my book. We read and write in silence. But we want what, what needs are fulfilled by reading in silence about an imagined world, even while belonging to a communities of readers, having a similar but often quite different experience. In other words, we're all reading the same book, but we're reading it alone. We may come to understand, in fact, whether literature has an evolutionary function. When we do so, our defense of reading may be more precise and more eloquent than anything that I can say. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you all for coming. Yes, Ronnie? Uh, you talk in, in the book about the future of the humanities in a university that's increasingly dominated by the sciences, and I'm wondering if the backdrop for your talk uh, was because of that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. Ronnie, I actually, th I think I thanked you before you came, but you, Ronnie helped me a great deal uh, about talking about uh, the economics. I talked about the prose of a university and the poetry. The answer is the economics of the university, which Ron is really the world's leading expert on, uh, does affect the humanities. I mean, right now we're under a, uh, a financial crisis and we're being to, uh, asked at least to create models of cutting back. But the humanities don't raise much money through grants. And, uh, you know, the, the problem with the humanities in terms of the economics of a university is that people ask, what are you doing? You know, there's no, we, we don't patent what we're doing. No truck backs up to the Goldwyn Smith to take away the widgets that we manufacture today. You know, so we have to justify ourselves in somewhat in the very intangibles that I spoke about. Um, obviously, uh, we sometimes think uh, that we don't get the intentions, uh, the attention that sciences get. And you've written about how humanists don't necessarily make the same, science, or same salaries as, as uh, Jeffrey Sachs makes as an economist. But um, so we have to justify, one way we, we justify ourselves, obviously, is by teaching across the spectrum of the university, whereas uh, it's our responsibility to feed in much of what's called a night writing program. And we need to just, and, and another way is our teaching loads are larger. Uh, and uh, we have to continually make the case, I think, that what I've been trying to make today, what humanities do, what we do as teachers. I think that, I mean, one of the things I didn't talk about, actually, which worries me, 
is the, what I call the decline of the public intellectual, which I, I just contribute an essay in a book of that. Because if we talk in academic jargon and we uh, sort of ostrich ourselves and pretend that we're doing work that's so important and so that we can't explain it to the rest of the world, uh, this is not good for the humanities. It's good for the humanities when people uh, can speak about what we do. I mean, one of my sort of litmus tests always has been if I ask somebody in the sciences or engineering what they do, that they can tell me, assuming that I'm, you know, and, and, uh, that I can understand. And I think we need to be able to do that. I think that one, one way the humanities have somewhat gone astray is creating our own private language and pretending that, uh, I mean, I think science has done a better job sometimes in explaining what they do that, than what we do, and that there's this incredible, uh, there's a divide between sometimes the world of the university, say, in the world of journalists. In doing research on this book, I've, I've uh, writing on the Times, the Times has been pretty generous about giving me access uh, to wander around their building, and they are, uh, and talk to people there, obviously by appointment, and, but they're very, they think, you know, they think that we're all talking in tongues and we have particularly uh, literature professors and I think it's important that we kind of bridge the gap. I mean, I, I'm all in favor of people like Stanley Fish writing blogs for the New York Times and I'm all in favor of our people when asked going on NPR and talking to people. I think crossing over is, is very important and, and uh, I've tried to do that in some of my books but I also think that we need to we need to encourage people uh, to be part of the public, the pu the public discourse, whether it's locally or uh, beyond that. Dave. Um, yeah, I, I had a question for you. I, most things I've seen have gotten considerably better. My TV's gotten better from the first one I bought. The engineering are building yeah. great buildings. The athletes have gotten bigger, stronger, better, faster. Yeah. Is it true that are the modern authors better than the? Uh, Shakespearean, Tolstoy, I mean, can you make that of faith or yeah. <laughs> Walter, I was going to call on you to answer that. He's a great Shakespearean. No, other, 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 modern West is better. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I think, um, I think um, we, we like to think in the humanities that there's a kind of teleology of criticism, that we're all getting better and smarter so that my criticism is better than my predecessors and my younger colleagues will write better than I. I'm not sure that criticism advances teleologically and I'm not sure, or high, and I mean like a kind of evolutionary Darwinian, that's what I mean by teleologically. And I'd, I'm not at all sure that, um, the same th that the same thing is true, of, of, that it, I'm sure it isn't, that writing gets better and better. That, that I, I, I just don't, I don't believe that. I think that uh, there are some great writers in every era uh, and uh, surely even though I've been reading a lifetime and really this book is really kind of a book report on a lifetime of reading and teaching, I haven't read a fraction of all the books and I'm constantly discovering what's this that I neglected. Uh, my colleague Kevin pointed out an author, Kevin Attell, professor in English, told me about an, an author that I was sort of very vaguely aware of, like so vague that I knew he had written the film for the Garden of the Fitzy Contini, and now I've read everything that's translated uh, by him, and I found some things that I just think are absolutely masterworks, uh, including one book that's not even avail uh, is not available in English anymore, except in that those five short, short stories. So, I don't think writing is getting better. I mean, it, in, in, um, I mean, we have amongst us in America, we have some very great writers. I mean. The next time it's America's turn to win the Nobel Prize, I would guess, guess it would probably go to Roth or Updike. Uh, I'd put my money on Roth personally because I like him better. But, uh, and, uh, but I mean, I, so I mean, we certainly have pr productive and writers. And it is true that the act of writing has changed because of the, in I mean, in I mean, the internet. I mean, uh, uh, how many, many books I've written, I could have written a lot more if I had, had the internet the first 12 or 15 years. I mean, it helps to, I mean, not just the, the, I'm talking now about the fact you can look up anything like that and also the fact that you just, it's easier to write on a word process, of, I think, although there are still some people out in, 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 that I know uh, uh, who write uh, from yellow sheets of paper and uh, 
but I think the technology it helps writing, but it may also, there may be ways in which the technology uh, is, doesn't help writing too. It may be that we write too many words. It may be that the uh, activity of editing takes different forms. It may be that you don't go to bed just sweating over a sentence because it's there and you can play with it the next day. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, I don't know if I've become an easier writer or a less neurotic writer. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Uh, you talked about crossing over where uh, literature professors would come out on the radio or the newspaper and tell yeah. you about what they're doing. Do you think in the 21st century there might be a different kind of crossing over whereas literature professors may go read those books behind you about the sciences with the same kind of reading strategies that you were talking about? Well, I, th I think uh, that my reading strategies are good for reading any text to the extent, uh, maybe not, you know, advanced formulas, and, but I think, I mean, I sometimes, uh, I make, I, I read science, I read, but not, you know, advanced science, but I try to read uh, books about evolution, which is a subject that interests me, and I try to read uh, the Science Times, which although to, uh, to me at least is very valuable on Tuesday, because it may, it key, and, but I think, uh, so I think skills of reading can be taught. I mean, one thing that's slightly different, in the scientific writing, they want people to write in, in passive voice, and we write in active voice. But I think skills of reading closely and careful, carefully are somewhat transferable. Although, as I say sometimes, because I, some Roger kindly mentioned, I've won some of the teaching prizes here. And when I'm on those committees, I always remind people that some, you know, if somebody's in, uh, on a committee, and say, well, what kind of teaching is that? Uh, I remind people that teaching and probably reading is somewhat field specific, that there's not like one universal rule. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I mean, I, was, I, I can remember uh, when I was on the Weiss Committee trying to explain to people that we all don't do exactly the same thing and that uh, we have to sort of uh, under, try to imagine that there are other kinds of things going on in the world. I, wasn't a, I was the only English professor there, but it's not always just one person talking to another, you know, without notes, uh, which we imagine, you know, that's sort of the model that some of us have of teaching, exactly what I'm doing today. But there are lots of models, and there's lots of models of reading. Any other questions? Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, Kush. Yeah. As you know, sometime in the 70s, in the 80s, there was a movement out of France which was called anti-humanism. Right. And it's had a great influence right here at Cornell. Right. And other institutions. Did you feel as a humanist an obligation to engage with that attack? Well, I've engaged with that attack, as you know, in several books. This book that I, I mean, I, I you know, uh, I would say that uh, as much as anyone, I'm a successor to you and Abrams as a humanist at Cornell. You know that. So certainly undermining uh, or underlying my uh, basic premises are, the, are, are implicit discussion with other kinds of reading. So in my work, I've engaged Derrida and structuralism and post-structuralism. Uh, and also, but I have to be fair, I've also assimilated some of what they, I, I, I have not been, I, I, I've, my pluralism includes respect for the for the emphasis on resistant reading and the emphasis on uh, newest or on newest the emphasis upon kinds of reading history in terms of uh, the dispossessed, the women, uh, uh, the the poor, the um, the powerless. So I haven't been. I don't consider myself antagonistic to. Uh, Everything of uh, of of French theory, I think I, I think I've learned uh, a good deal. It, I've engaged with it. Yes, I've engaged it in my life a great deal. I mean, and probably uh, whatever reputation I have, some of it comes from books like uh, you know the humanistic heritage and things, and then the case for humanistic poetics. Uh, there's, uh, this book was somewhat appealing to a larger audience, and so the kinds of discussions I had, uh, you know, uh, with, with Demand, you know, I've written a pretty well-known piece on the Demand, uh, are not in this book. That's, they're mentioned, and I talk about deconstruction, and sometimes was, the, you know, what I learned from it and with respect, but the kind of... Uh, analytic and uh, read what, what the word that used to be used, rigorous debate, uh, I've had elsewhere. <laughs>
I mean, it's in, it's in, it's in my books, but it's not, that's not, it wasn't the purpose to revisit that here. But I, I, and I always tried to find, frankly, even within uh, the post-structuralist and some of the people, I mean, I knew Derrida a little bit, I tried to find humanism where, you know, in, in those people when I could. And uh, so that's, uh, but I have, you know, been debating and talking to the, those people and been on panels with them for much of my professional life. And, uh, but I don't, I don't consider myself an anti-anti-anything. In other words, I like to think that, uh, I like, I mean, we're all, I like to think the doors and windows are open in my, and that I've learned from, I certainly have learned a lot from Derrida in terms of looking for gaps and fissures and enigma, and I've learned about Foucauldian aspects of talking about history. So I don't toss those people. But uh, when I think they're wrong, or like, well, the, my, one of my, uh, famous encounters was, was working with the wartime journals of the Mon, and uh, I made many wrote about that, and you know, in the eighties was a kind of a, did a kind of dog and pony show of, on that with some people on the other side. But I'm not doing that now, at least not today. Uh, <laughs> when you mentioned the word crossover, I also meant, and I use that word a little loosely, crossover to me also meant writing, some of my books have been sort of jointly published as academic books and non-academic books. So like book on Run, you know, the Holocaust is not a, I try to write books that don't appeal just to the 400 people who might buy an academic book. So crossover means sort of writing for a larger audience. Anyone else have a question? Uh, Mark? Yeah. You mentioned uh, in, uh, the period after reading, when you close the book and and uh, reflect. Yeah. And I wonder if you have any particular wisdom for us on the, that process. That uh, there is a process which I uh, have ta I talk about in the book, which begins with uh, immersion in the text while reading, to the kind of retrospective feeling you have when you close a book, and then that's some, that I go from stage one to five. Uh, and the fifth stage is uh, sort of how assimilating it into, the, into what we know about life and what we know about history. It depends on, obviously, the book. But I think uh, what we bring from a book is, no, is not exactly the book, because your memory quickly fades. But it kind of takes its place in your pantheon of understanding. So an example of that would be some of the books that I mentioned in passing today, like, for example, uh, the Balzac and Stendhal and how I understand them. And, uh, uh, so your memory of a book is not the whole book exactly. It's sort of how you take it into the, your perspective of, of, of everything else you've thought about and studied. And uh, that kind of uh, putting, you know, that, there's, there's kind of a stage of critical analysis and then there's a sort of a final stage of putting it within your own personal uh, zeitgeist or context. And, but this changes too. I mean, you know, when you, it, when you, you I, I love to reread. Marcia sometimes thinks, makes fun of that. She, she'll go and read another book, and I'll read the same book for the fifth time. And it's not just because uh, I write a book, uh, I, I, I'm going to write about it, although I often do. But it's also the idea you just see it, it just sees different and feels different. I mean, reading, you know, uh, reading a, a book is, 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 a second time is, is like, um, it, it is not the same. It's not the same experience. I mean, it's a little, you know. There's a kind of joisance and a kind of pleasure, to use Bart's term, in in, in rereading. And I've actually talked, um, and about in some of my books, the ascetics of rereading. When I talk a bit about that here, which is very different. So that's sort of a partial answer. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so if we're, if we're going to accept the internet, right, then we also have to accept the language of the internet. So that would include text messaging. Right. And what, how, how, would, um, how would these uh, acronyms, the OMGs and the RU, affect the humanities? I mean, the ones who are text messaging now are the ones who are going to be writing uh, later in, in the future. Well, I talked, I mean, I mentioned, I, you, were, I, you know, I think that there are people are going to write. I mean, they are writing. There was an, even the last, uh, two weeks ago, if you remember, there was a, fee, uh, uh, an, uh, a New York Times magazine which taught, uh, uh, called Screens. Well, Screens is actually the name of a blog by Virginia Heffernan, who's, at, who's sort of their, their, their hipster. And so they had she had obviously talked 
uh, the editor of the uh, Sunday magazine section into giving her a shot. And so they talked about uh, some of these issues. I, I think that people are, going, are, are already writing about email. I mean, I, see, I have a son who texts messages. Uh, frankly, uh, I, I mean, this is my blood. I said, I would rather hear from you on telephone than to get three word messages here, half of which are in, you know, some, so, uh, that, that are written in some foreign tongue because, you know, they're, they're, they're initialed. And then also things happen, you know, and I mean, in, in, and someone's going to write at least from a, about the, at least the social aspect of text messaging and also the social aspect of email. And I mean, these are, these are, uh, I mean, is it a political act to write people three words, uh, answers to uh, complicated questions, and can you do that, and, or are we moving towards some sort of reductive, you know, kind of a reductive non-language? And did you ever notice, and I, he says, as someone who does it, how many typos you make in emails because you're trying to answer more than you possibly can? Probably half the people in this room have seen me. I, I mean, I don't make typos in my books, and I try not to. In, but you're writing. You, we're doing so much writing, and uh, text messaging is even is even worse. So you can get misunderstandings because people can, uh, you know, can can le leave out a letter, uh, or so, uh, uh, and uh, or or they initial or they send you a, a, a word. They send you something without vowels, and you know you wonder, you know, what if they're talking about a product, or if the missing U between the F C K is something. In other words, where you start wondering about these missing letters, you know, you get this text message with no vowels, and you try to think how you're going to construct that as a message. So, anyone else, or should we? Let's take this as the last question. Go ahead. I wonder if you could speak further about a point you made uh, near the end of your talk, uh, that of the confluence between literature and the cognitive sciences. Um, I, I'm speaking as a, a neuroscientist and sometime English major, and um, we see this happening in new books like uh, Lisa Zunshine's Why We Read Fiction, right. and even in new departments now like cognitive studies at Case Western Reserve. Uh -huh. um, but it has struck me uh, from participating in it as a scientist that it's very much a one-way conversation. Um, the, the literature people are reading cognitive science, but the neuroscientists aren't really reading literary criticism. And um, to some extent, I think that's enforced by the structure of academia. I mean, when I write about uh, autistic memoir and its um, relation to literature and the arts, as a neuroscientist, I'm not doing anything for my tenure case. So I wonder, um, where that is going and whether, you know, the existing structures of academia are really going to put the brakes on it. Well, I mean, I think that's a very good question. I have of, I, I've often wondered uh, why there hasn't been more dialogue with cognitive psychology at Cornell. I would be more worried if you were not reading literature than not reading liter literary criticism. But I would be interested in the, in, in the, in knowing uh, or learning or talking to people about why people read literature, what it does for us. Uh, is this an evolutionary thing? Because people, we don't know that people were writing stories. They were writing pictures to uh, 10,000 years ago. We see the beginning of story right with the Egyptians and the Sumerians. But I would like to know why, what, what, what triggers that and how that, wor what, how that interplays with what we know re about recent work in evolution, and I don't know that. And I think, uh, I'm not sure it's just you missing. I don't think we, maybe we've paid as much attention to that. It may be one of these uh, humanities seminars should work, should take that up. Uh, so I think that the, um, it's hard to break down into the disciplinary habits and boundaries. And often when we do, we sort of, hi, thank you, we kind of follow the flow and we don't, you know, where we don't really, uh, we often think, don't think out of the box. And we need someone to take that initiative. Well, thank you very much. If you want, I'll stop. <laughs>